Hello, folks. Another episode of Burning Platform. And it's a real honor and a pleasure to have Paul Cochina here today. Good friend. I run into him God, in airports and sapphires all over the world. Paul, I don't know how you travel as much as you do, but thank you for joining me. I know it's taken a while to set this up. Brag about yourself for a couple of minutes, and then we'll touch on a whole bunch of <laughs> whole bunch of really interesting topics that affect SAP customers, but broadly every enterprise customer. So thank you again for joining me. Brag about yourself. <laughs> thank you, Vinny. And it, it, it's a pleasure to, to catch up. And I apologize again. It's taken way too long. Uh, it's been a crazy year, a lot happening, a lot of different places, a lot of different events. You know, and uh, as as a Canadian, we're not good at bragging too much, but I'll tell you a bit of context about my, myself. So I've been involved in the SAP ecosystem 30 years now, actually 30 years this year. Customer involved in building the Americs SAP user group over many years on their board, setting up many different communities, customer center of excellence, enterprise architecture, asset management, uh, SAP mentor, um, Many different roles, but uh, a common thread through all of this, it started actually when I was first introduced to ASUG back in, in, in 1993, was a passion for community and a passion for, I'll term it, leveraging the power of a community and a, a network of uh, individuals, um, peer groups, uh, cross organizations. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, community was important in the early days of R3. Um, we'd get together as customers to talk about uh, different aspects of our journeys, whether we were implementing or post go live, getting value. I was chatting with someone the other day about this. You know, and you probably re recollect this. Um, we used to think R3 was pretty complicated back in the day. Roll forward 30 years later, oh my God, it's off the charts. Um, the importance of us learning together and working together, especially in the age of AI, has never been more important. So um, okay. I have a lot of fun talking to so many people. And uh, what I, I think of doing is helping leverage the power of the community to help accelerate understanding, um, adoption, and just how to make things better, not just for companies, but for the, the people as well inside them. So let's talk about you. you you touched on at least four topics that I want to drill down into. Let's start with communities. You know, your definition, I know you travel all over the world. Tell me how you, you know, how you structure these. So talk about that. Next one we'll talk about is, now clearly ecosystems are really important. In the SAP world, you know, I've written books called SAP Nation that cover the whole ecosystem. So, you know, how in the, in the community framework, how our ecosystem is complicating or facilitating that. Then let's talk about enterprise architects. I know you, one of your prime audiences tends to be EAs. So in this complicated world we live on, live in. So let's talk about the challenges of their job. And then finally, you mentioned COE, Centers of Excellence. So let's talk about how that is. I mean, that, that's a word I don't hear quite so often as much, did about a decade ago. So tell me how that's evolved. Let's start with your big passion around communities. So communities are more than just, you know, attending an odd webcast or the meet up once or twice a, a year to be talked at. Um, to me, the evolution of communities, there is something I read back in, uh, I think it was June of 2020, early on in COVID. Uh, a lady, um, I can't recall her name right now, but wrote, we almost don't need more content in the world. We need a better job of co of curation and sense making of what's out there. And, and as I think about the evolution of communities, I think of from a couple of different dimensions. One, yes, content is important. Curation and sense making as a community is important, especially now with so many rapid changes. Right? How can we, as a group, make sense of what's happening and the impact? The other piece is. Um, learning from a, from a curriculum aside, uh, we need to learn at a much more rapid pace. I think the half-life of education has gone down tremendously. And, you know, we're just an inundated with all kinds of new technologies. So that aspect of learning together. Um, another aspect of this is in addition to curriculum is coaching as well. 
And I think it's never been more important um, with all kinds of different generations in the workplace of all learning from each other. Um, many of us that, like yourself, have been around for, for quite some, some while, we need to continually upskill and reskill, as well as the newer, the I'll term it, the younger generation in the workforce, we can learn so much from each other. The other, uh, these are, I'm just walking through a bit of my eight C's of the community. Uh, the, the other dimension, um, I mentioned about coaching, and the other dimension is conversations. We need to get together for connections and conversations. Um, I'm a bully, big believer in the events that we do not need to be just be done for the sake of coming together to, to be talked at, but we have to have the conversations post the, these events, be it virtual or physical, to really make sense at a much more rapid pace. I think, you know, between one tech ed once a year, between one Sapphire once a year, that is not enough. I think, you know, back 20 years ago, that may have been enough with the pace of change, but it's so not that today. Another dimension as well is we see it in many different aspects is crowdsourcing. Um, we need to crowdsource as a community to help get answers to problems. And I think it's never more been relevant as well of this whole aspect of collaborate collaboration as well. Um, we need to collaborate much more as, as a community. So I think of all those C's in essence work in, in harmony, we're evolving towards a next generation community that can operate at, at a much faster pace. And something else I've been looking a lot to lately, um, many of you may have heard the term communities of practice. Um, I had a great conversation the other day with a, a friend of mine, Phil Reed with JP Morgan Chase who is talking about the communities of practice they have within JP Morgan Chase. I think they have something like 100,000 plus IT people inside that organization. And really that aspects of having these communities of practice that aren't just audiences for material, but actually people that work on, your, on their practice. What I see things evolving as communities being much more of these communities of practice and engagement um, where you learn stuff, yeah, as well, but you practice it inside your, your day job. Um, so that's a bit of my, what I've been thinking about and what I've been seeing around communities. And, you know, fortunately, um, I think this has been resonating as well with customers. So Paul, you have, I, I see you travel all over the world and you put some structure around it. There must be some method to the madness, how you decide where to show up and Talk about that a little bit. Yes, it's interesting. I've just finished uh, 17 roadshows across North America since February 28th of getting customer together locally. You know, it's interesting. Um, as much as we talk about all this digital communication, um, people love to get together locally with their peer groups. And uh, my whole essence of this one, uh, going to be 19 city roadshows once I'm done in a couple of weeks, is to further engage with the enterprise architects and the FTP customer base locally to connect them together, to share information. Um, and that's how you really accelerate understanding and adoption. And it's been, it, it's rewarding when one, people come, and two, when people ask, when are we meeting again? So um, as much as we talk about all the digital stuff, people hunger for this interest of getting together with their peer groups. So Krishina becomes the guest of honor. Krishina becomes the reason people come and bitch and moan. And <laughs> Paul becomes the Paul is the host for helping bring these people together. And I've been fortunate enough to have been around this uh, ecosystem long enough that that generally, if I put something out and invite people to come, they I'm fortunate that they tend to come. So you mentioned the word ecosystem. What do you find? Are these are these employees of SAP customers? Are they are you attracting more partner folks? Tell, tell me the mix of the audiences that, that you're getting. And so round one, round one was partners, getting. If it's a partners, how do you navigate that? Um, you know, because they're more transient a a demographic. So talk a little bit about that. Round one in, in 2023, I'll turn was more about customer engagement, you know, getting the customers together from the from the get go. Um, round two and 24 is actually going to engage the partners a lot more deeper. And I think I'm, I forget the last stat, but it's probably 23,000 different partners in the in the ecosystem. 
Um, and with SAP's intent to be at industry cloud, other different things of, of partners doing more. Um, I'll be honest, Vinny, in terms of haven't quite cracked that nut yet, but it's important dimension. I mean, I'm amazed at the number of customers that don't even know to go to the SAP store, for instance. Um, so the, decades ago, the partners were, I'll say a more minor piece of the equation, um, but they've stepped up to a whole greater degree these days. Um, and particularly as well as, as customers look at the solutions they need to move to, um, to further augment uh, SAP, um, it even becomes more relevant um, to be able to look at and monitor all the things that are happening in the partner ecosystem. You know, so you know, one eye in SAP and one eye in the ecosystem. You know, I helped uh, Peter and Thomas write a book last year on different industries, right? One of the most fascinating insights I got was how the ecosystem around, around SAP is no longer just the SIs, you know, the extensions and the Deloitte of the world that get a lot of the attention. But mm -hmm. you know, I saw strategy firms, uh, BCG, McKinsey, people like that. I saw industrial robotics firms. I saw, God, logistics, uh, micro fulfillment logistics firms around SAP. I saw obviously SAP.io, which is a lot of startup foundry for startups, uh, some of that. So I actually worked with Frank Roland, who at that point worked for Peter. And I said, let's bring out some of these new partners that a lot of people don't even know are part of your ecosystem. So, but it blew me away how much the ecosystem has changed and actually exploded. Oh, it definitely has. I, I mean, I actually caught up with Frank Ruland and we had breakfast in, in Heidelberg a couple of weeks ago and, and, and chatting about the, the, the same thing. And it, it, it you're, you're right. And, and you have to, I'll say it, you can't just trust what your snapshot was of the ecosystem, you know, as of three or four months ago, even. New partners are coming in. Existing partners are growing your, your portfolio. Uh, I think as you, as you were talking, uh, I thought of, you know, if you look at our solar system, right? SAP being the sun. And back in the old days, you just had, you know, a number of planets just in around it, which were the big SIs, so on and so forth. Well, it's gotten a lot more crowded in terms of uh, the players that, that, that are out there. Um, and especially, I'd say, with BTP. In, in the mix as well now, um, that has really uh, escalated things. I, li I like your planetary um, metaphor. I wish I'd used that in the book. <laughs> um, Maybe your next one, Vinny. Hey, always, always working on a book or two. Um, let's talk about enterprise architects. I'm fascinated by, you know, you mentioned how complicated the world has become. In one of my early books, I talked about Ring fence strategy, you know, don't don't try to replace your core mainframe or client service system. Ring fences with you know new incremental cloud cloud software, which SAP itself has adopted, right? I mean, more and more incremental solutions are being released only in the cloud. But from an EA perspective, my God, you end up with hundreds, 200, 900 different applications. Are they tearing their, how do they manage? Tell, tell me about their, their challenges. Tell me about what do they enjoy in the job and what are they frustrated? Well, I, I mean, the, the role continues to evolve and as well as its importance, you know, uh, and I actually did hear Christian Klein at the DSAG meeting a couple of weeks ago mention the word enterprise architecture. Um, so that, well, and the second shoe dropping on that one was I think the week before he announced the acquisition of my good friends at Lean IX from an enterprise architecture side. So with all this complexity and, and you know, the rate of change, if you don't have a good architectural plan, if you don't have a good purview of where things are going, you're just headed for disaster. Um, so the other thing these architects are sort of dealing with, if you think of their world, um, it used to be very much contained inside their organization, you know, on premise, their own hardware, so on and so forth. And if you look at now the evolution to the cloud, not just one cloud, but invariably a hybrid cloud in many cases, um, 
all the different technologies that are now coming to play. You know, you had basis and you had art three and you had a bunch of modules. Life seemed complex back then, but uh, it's relatively easy compared to today. Um, and architects are also dealing with another bit of a change too with the move to the cloud. And generally, if you look at it, architects grew up by knowing technology and deep on technology and then evolving, right? Some of that technology stuff is moving over the cloud these, these days as well. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, and you're familiar with the subject of business architecture, I imagine. You know, interesting enough, I asked in all my 17 cities so far, rooms of 40 to 100 people in the rooms, how many of you are interested in the subject of business architecture? Invariably, at least 80% of the hands uh, rate, uh, went up. So, you know, it's interesting what I've observed in addition to these architects, interesting to understand more about keep up with the technology, they're becoming much more attuned, I think, in understanding, wanting to understand more about the business side of things. Um, they have to go in parallel, right? I mean, multinationals in particular are always switching countries, There's decentralized, centralized models and, you know, business models are evolving. So you, your enterprise architecture has got to be flexible enough to keep up with it. Yeah, it's funny, in, I was at Gartner in probably 98 or 99, and I had a conversation with the EA. He says, you know, Vinny, I don't know, I need to think about a new career because everyone's moving to suites, and once the suite is there, what's my role going to be? And I said, you know, don't, wow. don't, don't jump so quick. I said, <laughs> these suites are not that deep. I'm already recommending best to breed solutions to people around the suites, right? I didn't call it a big fence back then. But uh, it, it turned out to be very true. You know, there's no single no. record. It, it, you know, we need, we need a lot of piece parts. So, uh, yes, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're talking about a number of different things as an architecture community. You know, some of the traditional technology topics, um, uh, and I'll term it the technical side of, of the, I'll term it the content stack, but the other piece is the multidisciplinary or the soft skill side. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the whole technology side, we're talking, you know, number one is sort of the focus on AI and automation, right? Um, there's a strategy, methodology, and tools. Um, there's things like um, continuous improvement and process transformation in the mix. Things like business technology platform. You know, sustainability is also coming in, in, into the mix. You know, and what I'm seeing and hearing conversations on you know, just like cybersecurity is built into everything, right? You know, sustainability being in, embedded. Um, and other topic areas we're sort of looking at are things like women in enterprise architecture, getting more women into the, in, into the field as well. That's been pretty well male dominated. And other topic streams about, you know, what does the enterprise architect look for 2024 and beyond? Um, what, how is the role changing, especially in the age of AI? You know, what are the new, um, skills they need to acquire. I mean, there's storytelling, there's emotional intelligence, there's even, you know, learning how to speak better to, to C-level executives. So as a community, we're thinking about all these different technical and soft skills elements to help them evolve. You know, let's talk about the AI. I spent September, I've been to so many different events. I went to Dreamforce, Salesforce's event, I went to Workday Rising, obviously kept up with Google Next, SAP has announced Joule, it's a digital AI assistant. I mean, there's a lot of excitement in the in the market around AI, right? And you get the sense you're almost moving, you know, we move from on-prem to client server to cloud. We may be moving into a new architecture area. What are you what are you hearing from your EA audiences? Still premature, uh, I, uh, or are they like, yeah, this is this is definitely a, another transition. Uh, um, it is a, definitely another transition. I, I don't think people are a little unsure yet. You know when to sort of jump in with both feet. It's almost like there's this AI fog out there with so much going on right now. Um, and when will this fog sort of clear so the path ahead is a little more clear? Um, and I mean, you're seeing, and you've seen examples, I mean, of 
around HR and resume and so on and so forth, right? And things like that. And, you know, even though they are sort of um, maybe not as business critical sort of type of examples, right? I think there's a recognition now that you can use AI to augment your role. So there are things you can do to help in your role, like many roles as enterprise architect to make your job easier. You know, an assistant to do your first pass of, of different documents and things. Um, but I think what I'm hearing from, from many is um, it's hard to know right now, given how fast things are moving, uh, where you want to put really what, where you want to put your money. Yeah, I've, I've heard of about four or 500 different use cases. That's in the business application area, right? And then you talk to the hyperscalers and they're all excited about, hey, this is going to make DevOps much more low code, right? And so we're looking at a whole bunch of other implications for the enterprise. So yeah, you're right. I like the word fog because there's <laughs> so many different options that tough to nail it down. And I go back, I'm actually doing, we're spending half day on when I'm in, uh, I have a full day architects event here in Newtown Square at SME's headquarters on, 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 on Thursday. And we actually have a half day target on AI and the enterprise architect where we're going to be talking about these different subjects. And, and I think how you work your way through the fog in essence is by helping a community where people are talking about a lot of these different things, right? So a community is kind of like your fog light to sort of sort of get through this uh, as it sort of dissipates. Next time you do it, I'd like to join you and share with the 500 or so use cases that I've heard about. And, you know, I mean, I've been part of so many conversations. Fascinating, fascinating, but yeah, it is it is intimidating too. <laughs> well, and, and if you look at the discovery and analysis capabilities, right? There was a good session last week on how AI will change enterprise architecture. So there's some interesting things that are possible that it's one of those things like anything new, once you see some, some examples of what is possible, then you can extrapolate, as you said, you're talking about hundreds of them, different areas, right? You know, I so at Dreamforce, Sam Altman, OpenAI guy, he kind of like Mark Benioff interviewed him and he said, you know, what are you doing about hallucinations? And he turned it around and he says, you know, don't, 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 don't look at hallucinations as a bug. I feel it as a feature. But like, you know. It actually gives you, we don't live in a certain world, right? The world is full of uncertainties. Hallucinations are actually a way of expressing uncertainties. <laughs> so you actually turn it around and, you know, so like you say, once once you present something to a person, the, the way different people look at it, you know, whole new yeah. interpretation. So I would mean, definitely love this new term for making stuff up as being hallucinations. <laughs> and that's pretty complex. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back to you on how AI is, you know, kind of rewiring the EA's mindset. Let, 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 let's come back to that. Let's well, no. And you, you raise a good point. One of our, our conversations at an event, I think, of coming up in a couple of weeks is more having more of an AI mindset, right? And what does that does that sort of truly mean? So definitely. Let's talk about COEs. Uh, you're seeing a resurgence. I, you know, there was a lot of interest in COE, you know, master data and you know, standards for the enterprise and so on. And then it kind of seemed to disappear, at least from my um coverage. Tell me what you're seeing in that. Well, and it's, it's funny, you know, my, my, one of the, I'll turn with the, the legends from the COE side was my old friend, Derek Pryor, former garden, gardener analyst. And uh, we, we caught up for a beer in the UK uh, just last Friday. You know, Derek and I, I met, first met him when he was in the running Gardner S&E best practices group when it was a customer in the nineties. And then we did a number of different road shows on CUE for customers. And I remember in, in, in 2008 and some again in 2019, pre, pre COVID, you know, and, and CUE customer center of excellences were always the entity inside of an organization that was there to keep SAP running and keep SAP evolving. Right. Yeah. So the, the better run a, a customer had a CUE, the more value they got from their investment. Pretty simple. 
Um, and I go back to my power plant days. It was almost like having a control room for the CUE inside your enterprise that was watching everything, make sure the process is hum and look at minor improvements or major improvements to make your business more profitable. And, you know, that was my old friend, Michael Doan, um, uh, who talked about that for, for many, many, many years on Thrive After Go Live with the CUE. So, and you know, it's interesting. I did a whole series of five, six road shows that were pretty popular back in um, April, May, 2019, pre-COVID. So I think it's interesting. They seem to have gotten lost pre-2019, the subject area, not much conversation. And what has happened since? Well, this thing called cloud, right, has just gone off the charts. More and more customers moving to S4. Things like BTP in the mix, right? Things like uh, for monitoring, improving processes, things like SAP's Signavio, you know, the recent acquisition of Lean IX. There are so many things that these customers have to deal with. And we, you mentioned earlier ecosystem, right? You know, so many other different players inside the ecosystem. So with all that changing, one would think the model and the CUE probably has never been more important to stitch that all together. Um, and let's throw in the mix another dimension that you and I haven't talked about is called this whole with cloud costs going through the roof, FinOps that is now being part of part of organizations, right? So I almost see it as almost like these, almost a COE of COEs or community practice of community practices inside an organization on Venn diagrams of these technologies and different business elements around SAP that we probably need to think about as alternate, almost like a new business model inside companies to take care of their SAP estate in essence. That makes some sense? It makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you this. Though. It makes sense from a big, big adopter of SAP, right? Does it make as much sense for SMEs? Is there an external COE concept that they could leverage? Good point. And I think, you know, it's almost a no brainer for some of those mid-sized to bigger customers, right? Um, with their complexity and their cost, they have to do with it. Um, but, but it almost goes back to having more of these communities of practice internally that may touch on SAP, right? So thanks for uh, raising that. I, I'll, I'm, I'm going to give that a, a bit more thought on, on that end. I think there is a different model um, um, for some of those smaller customers overall. So what... In terms of the COE, are there like top three use cases you're seeing? Is it around, what do we do around S4 version management? Is it around, what do we do around changing global mix of strategic countries? Tell me tell me some of the use cases you've seen for them. Some of the things, you know, and this never gets old about continuing to squeeze out more value from the investment, right? Um, so looking for low hanging fruit to things that sort of, uh, the business can capitalize on. Um, and I think one of the most important things is activating innovations at a much faster pace than they have stor historically done. That is sort of, it, it is very critical. Um, so those are, and, you know, continuing to look at, I'll term it, you know, you want to activate the cloud innovations as they were coming. You want to continue on figure on with all these partners in the ecosystem that are doing new, new things. You know, what is the next range of things that you should be acting on? Well, so, but I, I do mean, like like the, the use case framing. I'm seeing a lot of interest, well, not interest, but I'm seeing a lot of lip talk around how the world is becoming deglobalized, how Germany is becoming deindustrialized, how the world is getting de dollarized. I think people have been have gotten tired of globalization, but what I'm what I'm seeing is multinationals are moving countries like never before. Right, Argentina too much inflation. Where can we move? Uh, Russia we have been forced to leave. Where do we go? China we need to balance our supply chains. We need China plus one. So that's the multinational, right? And you look at emerging countries, my God, some of the stuff that's happening in India, Kenya, Indonesia, and so on, there's a new world emerging, right? So I'm telling vendors, guys, this is actually an opportunity to look at new global, the re-globalization that's happening in the economies. It could be a COE focus area. 
you know, especially for bigger bigger SAP customers. So, anyways, did did want to add to your uh, plate, but that that's no, no, no. Hey, but I mean, and I've heard the same thing about sort of the I think you use the term deglobalization, right? In, in in a way, I've heard that a, across the world from many different dimensions, right? But I think what it points to is you almost have to have this greater flexibility to ebb and flow, right? As things change um, to sort of morph in different ways, depending upon it's, it's hard to predict, um, you know, things are unpredictable, right? So you have to be prepared to ebb and flow in different ways. To and the, know, the great, great thing about SAP compared to most of the technology vendors is they are in hundred and plus countries. I mean, they support God knows how many, different languages right they can support scripts from right to left and I, it, it's a it's a remarkably robust global piece of software so and a strong community globally yeah, that you know about right i i <laughs> not as close i mean i'm much closer to the functionality but you know clearly that that's something that coes could be could be leveraging more um hey i mean the ecosystem there are, are 40 plus user groups around the planet. You have the SAP community, you've got the partner community, right? To me, the you have the community is everywhere in so many different dimensions. Fascinating. Paul, final thoughts? L let's not make this quite so long. Um, I'd be interested in, and in, uh, you and I should plan some subsequent chats on be it AI and some different topics um you're always on the critical path because <laughs> if you're you know you want to do this from some admiral's club somewhere and he's like <laughs> so clear up your critical path and we'll bring you back every three months talk about a <laughs> topic every three months sounds good Vinny. always a pleasure always a pleasure paul look forward to having a cold one at, at an admiral's club somewhere <laughs> hey and, and reach out anytime based on on what you are seeing Let's flip it around a little bit. You tell me more what, what you're sort of seeing, and I can think about how that resonates and, and do some, uh, I'll term it some uh, checks within the community on, on some of this for some validation. I would, I would love that two-way conversation. Thank you.